Hi, everybody, and welcome to this first uh, live lesson for AXA Arctic Live 2021. It's really amazing to have you all with us. Now, this live lesson is all about the animals that live in the Arctic and how they are connected through food webs. And we'll be coming to all that shortly. So just to give you an overview of this lesson, first of all, we'll go over a few sort of rules and sort of how to use the chat app and all those other kind of things. We're then going to give you an introduction to where we are normally based up in the Arctic when we are not constricted by COVID. We're then going to look at some of the key terms needed to understand a food web and how animals are related through feeding relationships. Then we're going to have a look at some of the life that you might encounter on an Arctic expedition, do a food web activity together, and then last, we all have time for a Q&A um, with all those wonderful questions that you have gathered, and even those that you might think about during this live lesson. So it's fantastic to have you with us. We have classes from the UK, Spain, Ireland, France, and Ukraine uh, joining us today. Uh, big welcome um, to all of you um, in your classes. And we've received a special shout out, and that goes to Oscar from Anglesey. Hi, Oscar. Wonderful to have you back with Encounter Live Lessons. So uh, a few things to point out. First of all, is that if you would like to interact, um, post live questions, post comments, that type of thing, that you'll see there's a chat app to the side of the video. Now, you might want to have the video full screen in your class during the call. If that's the case, you can always view the lesson on your mobile as well. This is for the teachers or for parents and carers. Have a mobile, go to this web page on that. You'll be able to scroll down to the chat app and you'll be able to use that to take part in Q and A's and also to take part in polls. If you have any problems using the app or accessing the lesson in any way, do remember there's a little speech bubble at the bottom right hand corner of all Encounter EDU web pages. Click on that and someone will be on hand to help you along and to answer any questions you might have. So hope that's all working for you. So without further ado, let's get started. My name's Jamie. I've been to the Arctic, I think, seven seven or eight times, I can't remember, and also down to the Antarctic once. Now, the home for Arctic Live is an island called Svalbard, and that is halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. And we go up to the UK's Arctic Research Station in a very small community called Neolicent, and it's an amazing place. You fly in over the mountains. It's about a 20 minute flight from the main town on Svalbard, Longyearbyen. And you come in and this old mining settlement has been converted into an international science village. And when you're there, you have access to hot showers, which is wonderful, bedrooms, these are the important things, but also, of course, laboratories, skidoos to get around, the boat to get out to sample, the Arctic Ocean, and that's a fjord that comes past where we stay. And all those bits of infrastructure, facilities that allow you to research how this amazing but fragile environment works and also is changing. It's a very, very special place to be. So we are going to look in this lesson at the living things that are in the Arctic. And you probably already covered 
food webs a little bit in class, maybe at primary school, um, but maybe also a little bit when you're studying ecosystems um, at secondary school. Uh, so the reason why this is on the test, why is studying food webs important? Why did somebody put it on the curriculum? It's really simple. If you just study one animal in isolation, it's very difficult to get a sense of the whole environment. Food webs show how all life is really connected. And I've seen we've already had a couple of questions about what animal is more important. I think it was a copepod and the polar bear. But we're going to come on to those feeding relationships and the type of animals we might encounter in just a little bit. But before we do that, let's go over some of the vocabulary that we use to describe food webs. And the first one we're going to talk about are the vores, all those vore words that you may remember from primary school. So we have a carnivore, uh, that might be an animal um, like a polar bear, and carny is just the meat bit. Um, so if you eat meat, you are a carnivore. This is all how Latin has come into to science. If you're a plant eater, like a copepod or a clam, uh, or in uh, food webs near us, like a rabbit, then you're a herbivore, with a herby just meaning plant from Latin. Now, the last of the vores is the omnivore. Omni just means all, so you just eat everything. Um, that's humans um, and a variety of other animals um, too. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head um, some examples of, of other omnivores, um, especially in the Arctic. I'm not sure how many omnivores we have up, up in the Arctic, um, but those types of animals um, just eat everything. The next piece we're going to come up to is the relationship between who eats who. <laughs> So we have predator and prey. And those two words are just really describing those feeding relationships with different animals eat each other. So the predator is the animal doing the eating, and the prey is the animal being eaten. Uh, so an example of that from a sort of UK, European context would be a fox and a rabbit, for instance, or a fox and a chicken, where the fox is a predator and the chicken or the rabbit is the prey. So with all these science concepts that we're talking about, this vocabulary, notice how they can be applied to different habitats and different contexts. So while we're talking about the Arctic today, these are also ideas that can be relayed to your local environment and also to other environments of the desert, the rainforest, the coral reef, and other parts of the ocean. Now, the last term we're going to come on to are these two terms, producer and consumer. These are really important in understanding how energy flows through a food web. So the first thing that we have is a producer. Now, by its name, this is a living thing that produces energy, most often using sunlight. There's a process called photosynthesis, which I imagine a lot of you have covered already, but that's where plants, algae, some bacteria take energy from the sun and through the process of photosynthesis, turn this into energy. That sun energy then starts to flow through the food web and is consumed by other living things. So the algae in the Arctic Ocean is a producer. The grass that you might see out of your classroom window is a producer, that in turn is then consumed by other living things. 
outside of your window. It might be a, um, a rabbit or other types of small animal. In the Arctic Ocean, the algae is consumed by very small crustaceans. That's a technical word that involves everything from crabs, shrimps, etc., but tiny wee ones. And they will eat the algae in the Arctic Ocean. They'll consume that. We can get more complex in the way that we use the word consumer by talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers. So a primary consumer is the living thing that eats a producer. A secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. So an example would be the producer is grass, the primary consumer is a rabbit, and the secondary consumer is then a fox eating that primary consumer. And you can go through a food web at these different levels. Um, and des describe the consumers in a bit more detail. Now, if there aren't any questions just to go over that vocab, if I'm going too fast, then do pop in a question into the live chat just to make sure that we've got that vocab straight. Because the next section that we're going to go into is talking about some of the living things that you might encounter on an expedition in the Arctic. Brilliant. I haven't had anything come up yet, but remember, if something doesn't quite make sense for your class, do pop in a question just to clarify things. But for those questions to explore and to think about the Arctic and its living things and life and science up in the frozen north a bit more, we'll hold those types of questions towards the end of this live lesson. Brilliant. Let's have a think and look at the type of living things that you have in the Arctic. Now, we're going to go into this activity. Hopefully, you've got the sheets ready to do the activity along with me. There'll be some photographs. We'll give you a little bit of time to cut those out as we go along. But what I'm going to do is I've already cut out some bigger, clearer ones to go through with you. And we'll go through these one by one. And then afterwards, we'll look at putting them in a food web. How are these living things connected? So the first one I'm going to hold up is algae or phytoplankton. Now, these are tiny plant-like living things that are in the ocean. And it's really from, oof, let's see, mid-April that you get this kind of growth in the Arctic Ocean. And this is super important for all the other living things. This is the, well, I'm not going to give it away, but this is really important. So algae, here we have a producer in the Arctic Ocean. I'm just going to go through these in alphabetical order. So next up, we have the Arctic cod. Smaller than the Atlantic cod that you might find ending up in a fish and chip shop, but has a very, very cool trick. Has a special antifreeze in its blood to stop its blood from freezing at very low temperatures. Super, super cool little fish. Coming up next, one of my favorite animals that we come across up in the Arctic. That's an Arctic fox. Uh, we have them playing around Neolisund, the science village. Uh, they quite often sort of hide out under buildings, maybe near the kitchen door, um, and hoping for a sniff of a scrap. Um, but we'll eat a variety of things. Um, including caches they hide um, in the ground for overwintering, and also any um, reindeer or other carcasses um, that might have succumbed to the cold or other conditions. One of my little favorites, very cute little animal that we have up there. Next up, a truly wonderful whale, the beluga whale, 
one of the toothed whales. So unlike um, the baleen whales, which will suck huge quantities of seawater into their mouths and try and sieve out any small creatures, beluga whales are a toothed whale. So if you think about orca, killer whales, and also dolphins, a row of teeth in their mouth and actually hunt uh, animals. We were uh, really blessed a couple of years ago to have a pod of about 40 beluga whales around uh, our small research vessel um, and a really, really amazing sight. Um, these white whales uh, cruising through the Arctic waters, hunting along for their prey. Uh, next up is the clam. So a clam is um, a type of shellfish. It lives on the bottom uh, of the ocean. And like many shellfish, it is a filter feeder. That means it pulls through the ocean seawater uh, to take any small particles of food from it and use that to grow and get its energy. Now, this has been the subject of one of the questions already. It is the copepod, um, the amazing copepod. Uh, I find it truly astounding that there are 1,347 billion billion of these creatures in our ocean. That's 1,347 with 18 zeros afterwards. I don't know if any uh, of the um, adults who are, are supporting these classes can get that up on a whiteboard. One, three, four, seven, and, and 18 zeros, quite amazing uh, number of these. They aren't this big, they're about the size of a pinky fingernail. And uh, super, super important, related um, to, in the same group as lobsters, crabs, and shrimps, um, but that is the copepod, uh, C-O-P-E-P-O-D. Uh, next up, we have one of the most iconic animals um, in the Arctic, uh, the polar bear. And it's, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful animal. Many moons ago, we had a couple um, by our, our landing strip um, up uh, off the Canadian Arctic. And at this time of year, you will find them coming to the west coast of Svalbard. They come over from the East Coast and they come over uh, where they've been hunting seals um, during the winter and spring over to the West Coast uh, in the summer where there are plenty of bird eggs and fledglings um, to feed on. It's interesting, has a very interesting Latin name that gives you an idea about um, how it works. It's called Ursus Maritimus, uh, basically me meaning the sort of the sea bear and it spends a lot of its time on the sea ice and in between ice flows. Um, so that is the polar bear, quite a magnificent creature. One of the uh, facts that you may not know is that it's not white, its fur is not white, it's a sort of gentle cream color. Um, so if you think a polar bear is white, not quite white, a gentle cream, and some cool adaptations which maybe we can cover during the Q&A session. Uh, we have a, a ringed seal um, here, really, really wonderful. We had a bit of a seal encounter on one of our trips um, where we had cut a sampling hole through the sea ice so that we could put scientific instruments through the sea ice to look at the ocean below. And a seal thought this was a very good place to come and put its head on to have a look around. Uh, so I don't know who is more surprised, us or the seal, um, by that little encounter there. And last, but by no means least, is the walrus. Now the walrus, um, absolutely fantastic animal, um, incredible males with these tusks, um, but also using the whiskers on its on 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 its face to to hunt through the dark sort of dingy bottom of the ocean, searching for food down there. There's a little clue for you about 
what kind of feeding relationship that might be involved in. So that's a brief introduction to the type of animals that you might find on an Arctic expedition. What we're going to do now is going to look at doing a poll and we'll get up on screen the question, the interaction app uh, to the side of the screen should change now to displaying a poll and we'll just give you 30 seconds as the different classes to think about what do you think is your favorite or most what do you think is the most important um, animal in the arctic so we'll just give you 30 seconds having had that brief rundown to say what is your favorite animal in the arctic and we'll do this activity again this poll again at the end of the food web activity today Brilliant. I'm really looking forward to seeing what those results are. Those will come through um, soon and we'll be able to compare whether doing the food web activity changes your mind at all. So we're going to move now to the activity section of this live lesson. And remember, I don't know whether you're going to be working on your own or in small groups, but what you'll need is cut out the little uh, photos of the different Arctic animals, and you'll need a template. Uh, I've made my um, one out of a big bit of cardboard, um, just so you can see it a bit more clearly, um, but hopefully you've got a slightly smaller one, uh, and that you'll be able to cut out and then stick in the different places, and we'll work out together how all those different animals are related through feeding relationships. I said animals, I do mean living things, because don't forget the algae. So make sure everything's organized, you've got everything ready, and then in uh, just a few seconds, we'll make a start. I can actually see from the, um, the food web diagram that we have one in place already, and I think that is copepod going at the bottom there. So one of the easiest ways of starting with putting a food web together, first of all, we're going to look at arrows in a feeding relationship. Now, an arrow is the direction that the energy goes. It is not a, this animal is eating this animal. It's a direction of the energy flow. So what we need here is the living thing that the copepod is getting its energy from. And at the bottom of most food webs, we will find a producer. So looking at all the different living things you have left to sort, let's all try to find a producer and stick it in where the copepod is going to get its energy from. I wonder what you're going to pick. I already picked mine. I'm going to slowly bring it up. It is the algae. Oh, this is, there we go. Stuck that on there. So at the bottom of this food web, we have the algae, this producer creating energy or giving energy to the copepod because the copepod is happily munching on all this algae. Easiest now is probably thinking about what other animal do we think might be eating that algae? And I'm going to give you a clue. It's going to be a siver an animal that sieves through the water. Okay, well, I've got my one. <laughs> okay, and I imagine a lot of you have chosen clam 
as well. So the filter feeder is a technical word for a clam. And then we're going to put that one. Oh, I was about to have that eat the um, copepods. We'll have that put. Okay, so here we have the algae, energy from the algae going to the clam and the copepod. And I think, because the next one's quite complicated, you might need a little bit of a timer just to think through this one. The animal that's eating all these copepods. What animal are we going to put there eating all these copepods? And we've got a timer starting about now. Brilliant. I wonder how you got on. It is the Arctic cod, and the Arctic cod plays an incredibly important role turning these tiny, it was a bit crooked, my Arctic cod, there we go, uh, turning these copepods into bigger types of protein for other animals to eat. And hoping that this sort of 30 second timer gives um, you a chance to have a think, gives you a chance to um, talk if you're working in groups. But the next one I'm gonna try out, um, actually I'm gonna go for what is eating these clams. And I'm going to give you one clue and then 30 seconds. I'm going to give you the clue as whiskers. And then let's see how you get on. 30 seconds starting now. And there we have the whiskery walrus um, that is coming up here. There we go. So the whiskery walrus eating the clams, sensing them out, using those um, whiskers to sense through the bottom of the ocean. Uh, next up, let's go for, it's going to be a bit of process of elimination, but we'll, we'll go for the animal that eats mainly uh, the Arctic cod here so it could be one of one of two um so let's go for the animal that eats the arctic cod and i'm going to give you the clue unexpected visitor 30 seconds starting now Brilliant. I wonder if you got that clue. The unexpected visitor that we had when we were sampling was a seal that came up through the sampling hole. And the seal will just, oh dear, need to move the seal over a bit. There we go. Seal there. Now, we do have one other animal that eats the cod and I'm going to give you 30 seconds. What clue will I give you for this one? Uh, Flipper. Flipper's friend.
Brilliant. So hopefully most of you got that with the beluga whale, similar family to the dolphin flipper, and we're going to put uh, up here. And for the last two, we've got no clues. You've got your pure scientific brilliance going for you, but we'll give you those last two, 30 seconds, just get those last two in place. Brilliant. So we do have the Arctic fox here um, feeding sometimes on seal pups. We don't have a reindeer on this, but they do sometimes eat reindeer as well. And then the apex predator, the top of the food chain, is the polar bear. Um, and that has um, eating a lot of these animals, mainly when they're young. So they wouldn't really be taking on adults of these animals, but these are the types of young animals um, they would be eating. So just to go over an Arctic food web again. Food webs are super, super, super important because they allow us to understand how living things are connected. What happens here is that we have these feeding relationships. So we have the producers, the living things, creating energy from the sun that then passes to a primary consumer, like a copepod or a clam, then up to these secondary consumers, like this Arctic cod or walrus. Tertiary consumers, we have here, we have the uh, ringed seal, and then um, we could come up to even more uh, levels of consumers, but we have basically an apex predator, top of the food web, top of the food, these food chains. And what this allows us to do also is to think about what might happen if any of these living things were affected by changes in the environment, including human activity. So if the energy coming through didn't happen because copepods disappeared, how would that affect other living things in the Arctic? Well, we can see that the copepod and its health and the health of all these thousands and thousands of billions of copepods, if they start to come under pressure from environmental change, and that's something we'll be looking at next Wednesday when we look at how the Arctic Ocean is changing, that eventually will be affecting the health of the polar bear population as well. And I've seen here that you have these, that our favorite animals in the Arctic are very close to mine. 64% of you went for Arctic fox. They are incredibly cute, so no surprises there. Copepod at 18% and the wonderful beluga at 18% as well. Now, when we come to this, poll again. Let's change it. We probably won't change the wording on the slide, but we'll um, look at um, just when you choose an animal or a living thing, think about what you think is the most important animal in the Arctic food web. It is just such a wonderful place, but also very fragile as well. So think about how all these living things are interrelated and how the health of any one can affect the whole food web. And put that down. Now is the time to come and see what questions you have. Um, so for the Q&A section, those will come up on um, the chat um, with me and the wonderful Sim, who is handling all your questions and moderating those as well. You can put in your school or class name um, if you don't want to be anonymous, um, so we can we know who the questions are coming from. 
Um, but also, uh, you you please don't put in personally identifiable names, um, especially of students. Um, so questions coming up um, shortly, um, and we'll get those into the chat app and be wonderful to be able to answer those. So I think the first question um, was, which animal is more important, um, the polar bear or the copepod? Um, really, really um, fantastic um, question. As we've seen from that food web activity, you could say that the um, copepod is more important because it plays this really fundamental role at the bottom of the food web, turning the algae um, energy into something, into proteins that can be consumed by larger animals like the octocod cod and then feed everything else. But the polar bear also plays an important role in especially those apex predators play an important role in keeping other populations healthy. So they're often feeding on less healthy um, or weaker members of that population and play an important role there, perhaps even keeping the populations of grazing animals like reindeer down um, and keep, keeping the seal population in check, which means the fish population can remain healthy as well. So um, we then, next question, that was from St. John's School. Great, great question. Um, what's your favorite thing about your job? And that's from Barney Penhale. Um, I think two things, one of which is that you can see uh, the Arctic landscape um, behind me here. This is where we work. <laughs> Uh, and this is sort of the office that we have for a few weeks each year when we're up in the Arctic. It is simply stunning. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful places um, in the world. The light, um, the 24-hour um, daylight in the summer, the hours of darkness in the winter, the aurora, the life, um, the working with fantastic people um, up there, the sort of weird and the wonderful that seem to collect in the polar regions. That's a sort of fantastic thing. But I think, you know, now that we have the technology, and I think you can just see just um, here that sort of that black line is is a sort of where where we live, the sort of outlines of the buildings, be able to connect live to you guys um, is, is just amazing. Um, it's a very, it's just a rarity to be able to get up to the Arctic. So being able to, fingers crossed, um, next year to be able to speak to you live from the Arctic. Um, is, is, is a real, real pleasure. So let's see what the next question is. Wow, this is from Ullswater Community College. Um, why is the Arctic so cold? Um, it's a great question. Um, I wish I had a, a ball um, here. The simple sort of re reason why the Arctic is so cold is that the, the Arctic simply doesn't get as much solar energy um, as um, places um, nearer the equator. So as you move from the equator towards the pole, there is less solar energy coming to each of those places as you move north. So that's a very, very simple way of, of putting it, is, is this, so we're heated by the sun. As you move north, um, there is less sun energy to go around. In fact, there's no sun energy coming uh, for much of the year when there is the polar darkness, when the wobble of the Earth um, means that uh, there is 24-hour darkness um, during the winter in the Arctic, during the austral winter, which is our summer, um, down in Antarctica. So great question. And how cold does it get? The coldest we've had on expeditions, minus 48 um, degrees Celsius. Uh, but if we were up in um, Nelson at the moment, ooh, it would be between quite a nice warm, so between about zero and five degrees probably. Um, but normally when we're there in May, it's sort of between sort of minus 10, minus 10 and minus five. Um, so not too cold at all. But the wind can get up um, pretty quickly. Um, this is a lovely question. Um, what is your favorite ar ar Arctic animal and why? Lovely, lovely question. I mean, I do love the Arctic fox that lives around the base 
Um, super, super cute and lovely animal. But the one Arctic animal that I would absolutely love to see and I've never seen, and perhaps we should all organize an expedition, is a narwhal. Um, and I don't think we have a photograph of narwhal because we haven't ever seen one. Uh, but the reason why I think they're so cool is because they are a cross between a unicorn and a dolphin, and they are simply awesome. And I would love to see them. And we also know very little about them um, in terms of their behavior, why they have this amazing unicorn-like like horn. Um, simply a, a wonderful, wonderful creature. So I'd love, love to go up and see a novel. But lovely question. Thank you. Um, a great question coming through from Barney. Um, what's the most interesting fact you know about um, the Arctic? Um, most interesting fact I know about the Arctic. I think it's cool um, that the Arctic is named after stars. So there is a constellation in the sky, um, which is known as the Plow in English, which is known as Ursa Major or the Great Bear in um, Latin or sort of technically, and that points towards the North Star. And Arctos um, is the Greek for bear. So the Greeks called this area to the north um, the, the bear country, the, the, the place that the bear points to, the bear in the sky points to. So Arctos is named after the bear, the Arctic, and the opposite of the Arctic is the Antarctic. Uh, that's the opposite of where the bear is pointing to. So I think it's lovely that we have this old um, idea of the north uh, from the Greeks um, and have the Arctic named after where a, a constellation points to. Uh, <laughs> um, Harrow Way School um, have asked, uh, have you have you ever seen an animal that shouldn't be in the Arctic? It's a really really great great question. Uh, certainly, um, I haven't personally, but some of the guys who who fish and there's a small fishing fleet on Svalbard uh, are reporting animals like mackerel, which are coming further north because the oceans are warming. So you're getting animals, uh, especially in the ocean, coming further north um, because of the warming. You could debate. Um, there was there was no indigenous population on Svalbard, so should we be there? Um, should there be a human population on Svalbard? So that's one to debate, um, perhaps in the class after this lesson. Uh, prospect school, absolutely cool um, question. Are there bacteria um, in the Arctic? Uh, yes, there are. Um, and one of the really wonderful projects I was looking at um, in 2015 um, was on this bit of glacier going up this way. Um, that glacier is known as the Mitra Leuvenbrin. Um, and what we were looking at is how uh, life starts. So as these glaciers are retreating, that ground underneath where the uh, glacier had been is like new ground that hasn't seen uh, sort of fresh air for tens of thousands of years. And then looking at how bacteria start to be able to fix and change that rocky ground into some something that plants or small sort of algae can start to grow. So studying bacteria in the Arctic is incredibly important. And in fact, there's a, there's a major research team, there's a great team out of Aberystwyth University that do a lot of bacterial research on snow and ice, um, also um, in Greenland. Um, but bacteria, yeah, all over the Arctic and really important to study because they start to create the conditions that allow for life to flourish. Wow, Prospect School, you've got another cracker of a question here. Um, which animal is most endangered um, in the Arctic? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, there are lots of living things in the Arctic that are under pressure through environmental change. And it's very easy to pick up on popular species like the polar bear, um, where 
the degradation, the lessening of sea ice is making it harder for the polar bear to hunt. It's losing its hunting habitat. But it's also easy to forget animals such as starfish and sea urchin living on the bottom of the sea that rely on there being sea ice uh, and there's a sort of food coming from the bottom of the sea ice as algae make sugars. <sighs> Most endangered animal in the Arctic, I mean, in small populations, a narwhal is, isn't having a, a great, great time. It also relies on there being good sea ice. So a lot of the Arctic is under pressure. And as we've seen from the food web activity, that life is all connected. Wow, here we go. Um, how deep do walruses dive? Um, amazing question. Um, they can dive up to about sort of 80 to 90 meters, um, which is a, an amazing depth. So if you think that the deep end of a swimming pool is only about three meters, um, it's a deep swimming pool, that's 30 times deeper than that. That's way beyond the limits of uh, recreational scuba diving as well. That's down to about sort of 40 meters max, probably more like 30. Um, so super, super, super deep. And they can be down there for half an hour to go and get their lunch and various other things. And follow-up question here is, is how long the walruses live for? And it's about sort of 40, 30, 40 years, um, depending. Um, so fairly long-lived um, animal. Um, but great, great questions um, coming th through. Love this one. Do any animals eat polar bears? Not really. Um, they are, uh, we, we used this term apex predator before. And that's really sort of saying that they are the top of the food web. And so the, the, they're not the, they're not the, Sort of prey of any animal, although there, there, there might be some uh, injured polar bear or polar bear carcass that w w get, gets fed on um, by animals that sort of scavenge around, like the Arctic fox. But 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 not they're, they're not the prey of anything. In fact, they are the largest land slash sea carnivore, and they're one of the only animals for 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 whom the human is a natural. Uh, prey. Um, so we are very much up in their territory and they are, would quite happily have us for lunch. It's something we have to be very, very careful about um, when we're on expedition up in the Arctic. Great, great question. Well, I see we're sort of running out of time. We've got um, the ability for, I think, just um, one last question. And we're going to have this from Keras, Tristan and Livia. Um, what would happen to the animals if the earth heats up and the icebergs, the habitats, begin to disappear? Um, Keris, Lewis, and Livia, very few animals live on icebergs. Icebergs are bit of, um, bits of sort of glacier that break off into the sea or bits of ice cap. But the sea ice is incredibly important. Um, and, and as we change the environment, there's basically, a, you know, if animals can't adapt or living things can't adapt to a new environment. We're seeing that a little bit with polar bears. So they can't feed on seals on the sea ice, so they're now feeding on um, bird eggs and fledglings. Um, but it takes, I think it's something crazy, like 40 times as much you know, energy to get their food now that they're hunting in a new way. So it's, just, it's putting incredibly pressure on all these living things, and it's something that we need to be... Um, what did we think about in terms of a beautiful but fragile place and our responsibility to trying to conserve it as much as we can through decreasing warming? It's been fantastic having all these questions, and I don't know whether we've got a chance just at the end here to think about the last um, poll. Bring it up in the, uh, in, uh, on the side here. We won't worry about putting the choices back up on screen. But really, just to say thank you to all the classes who have joined, to remember about the interconnectivity, the interrelationship of life, and that we have to care about a whole ecosystem rather than caring about individual animals. That the science concepts that we've related to the Arctic today also relate to your local community and to other habitats. And 
just the next time you have the opportunity to be in nature, whether that's on a school playing ground, whether that's in a park, whether that's in a garden, whether that's on a walk, just have a think or look and observe at how nature is connected. It's been wonderful having you as part of this Arctic Food Web, Food Web lesson. Do join us for a whole range of other live lessons as part of AXA Arctic Live. But for now, thank you and bye-bye.